The Rust Foundation is recovering from what may have been one of the biggest public relations blunders in the history of programming. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, the Rust Foundation recently put out a request for comments for the initial draft of its trademark policy regarding the Rust language. Every language typically has a foundation and associated trademark. This is very common for a programming language to do, but why was the response to Rust so bad? So bad actually that a particular set of members forked the Rust language and renamed it Crablang in protest to the trademark policy and the anticipated clampdown of the use of the word Rust and cargo. So how did we get here? What is the history of the trademark policy and why was it received so poorly? So in August of 2022, internal to the Rust Foundation, the Rust Foundation and the Rust team came up with their first initial draft of the trademark policy. In January of this year, the Rust Foundation and the Rust team sought legal counsel to make sure that the trademark policy was legally binding. And then in April of this year, 2023, the Rust Foundation put that trademark policy as a request for comment to the community. We're looking at it right here, the initial draft. There are a couple things that make sense in this policy, but a couple things that don't make any sense. Let's walk through them. The first one is pretty straightforward. Basically, you can't use the Rust name or the Rust logo to make a profit or selling commercial goods. So for example, if I made a low level learning t-shirt and it had the Rust logo on it, I would be using the Rust logo to turn a profit for myself and that violates trademark policy. Sure, that makes total sense. As we go down the list here, they start to get a little, a little weirder though. So for example, showing support of Rust, while well, showing your support for the Rust project on a personal site or blog, you may use the name or logo as long as you abide by all requirements in the policy. Basically, you can't show that you have a commercial affiliation with Rust and that you're not a member of the Rust Foundation. Again, not so weird, but you're getting into this territory where now there's a weird gray zone about what is and isn't okay. After this, it gets a little more odd where, for example, you may use the Rust name in book or article titles and the logo and graphic components as long as you make it clear that the Rust Foundation has not reviewed, approved, or endorsed your content. So people started really getting mad about this one because the Rust Foundation, you would think, is, is trying to make the Rust language as usable and as widely spread as possible. And you could argue that this rule here makes it difficult for content creators like myself to make tutorials or videos about Rust without fear of being of infringing the trademark policy. And then the rest of these say basically that you can use the word, you can use the logo Ferris, for example, for as freely as you want, and a couple other questions or a couple other points that you know don't really matter. It's important though that we talk about do other languages have policies like this? One being, for example, Python. Python, the language, is owned by the Python Foundation, the Python Software Foundation. And yes, the Python language actually does have a trademark policy. You'll see that it has very similar things to the Rust policy that came out in April. So for example, you cannot use the Python logo or the, or the words Python company or Python language to make a commercial profit. For example, the commercial use of the trademarks is strictly prohibited. Also, you have to get explicit approval to alter the logo of Python and use that in any setting. So why was this received, the Python trademark policy, so much better than the Rust policy? I would argue it was the transparency and delivery by the Rust community. If you read the first paragraph of the Python trademark policy, they explicitly call out the general goals, the spirit of the law as it applies to the trademark policy for Python. All they want is for the words Python or the trademarks to not be used to refer to any other language in a way that is misleading about the modules or tools and make sure that nothing is commercially associated with Python that was not put out by the Python Software Foundation or in a way that confuses the community as to whether or not Python is open source and free to use. Basically taking a module and commercializing it and selling it as a for-profit module for Python. This is, in my opinion, the primary difference between the Python execution of the trademark policy and the Rust execution of the trademark policy. No one from the Rust Foundation put out a blog post or a video and said, hey, this is the reason why. They kind of just dumped some legal jargon into a document and basically confused the community. The community came back in that request for comments and gave a ton of comments, either in the form that the Rust Foundation put out for comment or on Twitter, for example. And in response, a few days later, the Rust Foundation put out this blog post, which was received even worse than the request for comments. So on April 12th, this blog post came out where they, they pretty much say, what was the purpose of making the trademark policy? How did they approach it? And they try to touch on the feedback here, but they actually don't go about addressing any of the concerns from the community. All they do is they highlight a bit of harassment they've been getting, which again is a bad thing. 
But this blog post made a lot of people feel like the Russ Foundation was going on the defense, like they were trying to play victim here and not actually addressing any of the concerns that the community had. This trademark policy left a lot of people confused, like this one Redditor here who says, hey, I have a package called Rust Maven Plugin. The use of the word Rust is in my cargo package. Am I going to get in trouble with the Rust Foundation for doing it this way? And he, he or she are only one of a lot of people who are equally concerned. Can I say I'm a Rust have my resume? Etc. Right. So in response to all of these comments and concerns on Reddit, Twitter, and in the formal process that they documented, the Rust Foundation wrote this article on April 17th, basically saying during the consultation period, it became clear that many people in the community had questions, concerns, and confusion surrounding the policy draft and the group overseeing it. The consultation phase of the policy drafting process was intended to give Rust community members the opportunity to review the first state. Um, basically, they go about saying that they acknowledge that they weren't transparent enough, and in the future, they're going to go forward with more transparency. I would argue that the damage is already done. There's already been a rift built between the community and the foundation as to the execution of this policy. Trademark law is intentionally vague. Granted, I'm not a lawyer, but the idea is that it just creates a framework that if a bad actor takes advantage of the trademark of Rust of Cargo, it gives the Rust Foundation an opportunity to hold them accountable. That being said, it does create a very odd gray zone that if you don't describe what the purpose behind it is or the purpose behind the law is, it can leave people in a state of confusion and concern for not only their content, but possibly their careers. This is the primary issue with the Rust Foundation's delivery of this policy. Unintentionally, they gave very vague and unclear guidance as to what the purpose behind the policy was. And in doing that, essentially confuse the entire community and left people worried about the state of the language. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Also hit subscribe, my finger's over here on the wrong side, I got a green screen going on. And then also go watch th this video, which I think you will enjoy just as much as this one.